Hello and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Steve Marks, the chair of the CMC Board of Trustees and president of Hannah News Service here in Columbus. It's great to see everyone here today. We want to welcome several new members uh, to CMC, uh, one of which is here today, Elizabeth Joy from Elevated Outcomes. Thank you. And then some that can't be with us, but we appreciate their membership, uh, Melanie Greeson, United Way of Central Ohio, Dale Greeson, Columbus State Community College, uh, Diane Radigan, Bobby Justice, uh, Janice Patton, Pam Cog, uh, Cobb with Signify Health. Thank you for your membership. Uh, and um, I'm going to do a quick word about membership, as you, as you might guess. Individual and corporate memberships are critical to the bottom line of Columbus Metropolitan Club. We need you, the patrons and fans of CMC, to step up and support CMC. Please join as a new individual or corporate uh, member or renew your membership. From now till August 31st, we are adding an additional two months to your uh, membership, so now is the time to join. You can learn more about CMC, register for events, join CMC, renew your membership, or make a donation anytime at columbusmetroclub.org. We are live streamed today thanks to our live stream partners, the Columbus Dispatch, PNC, and WOSU Public Media. We'd also like to thank those of you who purchased a virtual seat for today's forum. We are very grateful for the support and are able to continue live streaming services in large part because of you. Thank you. Today's forum, Conversation 2020, Black History 101 Mobile Museum is presented by CMC and Cardinal Health. It's brought to us with support from uh, Puffin Foundation West, the United Way of Central Ohio, Event Marketing Strategies, WCBE, Hilton Downtown Columbus, The Boathouse, and in partnership with the Central Ohio African American Chamber of Commerce. Won't you please help me thank them? Now please help me welcome Victor Crawford, CEO of Cardinal Health's pharmaceutical segment, to introduce our speaker. Victor. Thank you, Steve. You know, I'm honored to be here on behalf of Cardinal Health, and we are proud to support the mission of the Columbus Metropolitan Club as we bring speakers and topics for public consideration and conversation. And today, being able to bring the Black History 101 Mobile Museum to Columbus is a perfect example. Besides my role as CEO of our pharmaceutical segment, I have the honor to be the executive sponsor of our African American Network, which is our employee research group, and a member of the National Urban League's Board of Trustees. At Cardinal Health, we have taken a public stand against racism and injustice and are committed to having what we call courageous conversations about racial equity within our organization and in our neighboring communities. These conversations, along with a dedicated effort to provide education and resources, help empower our employees to change the way that we all think about racism, inclusivity, as well as equality. We know that we must look back on the racial injustices of our past, our present, so that we can all be part of a better future. Today's topic is one for most of us that's been left out of our schools, left out of our conversations, and left out of our day-to-day -day lives. We cannot begin to be fair and equitable if we do not understand the basics of who we are as a people and as a society. I am humbled to introduce both Ann Fisher, the executive producer and host of All Sides with Ann Fisher on WOSU 89.7 NPR News, and Dr. Khalid El Hakim, one of my Detroit homeboys as well. Thank you very much for being here. He is an educator, an entrepreneur, and is founder and curator of Black History 101 Mobile Museum, 
a collection of original artifacts of black memorabilia dating from the transatlantic slave trade era to hip hop, the hip hop culture. He's received national and international attention for his innovative work exhibiting black history outside of the traditional museum spaces, which we'll get a chance to experience today. Anne and Dr. El Hakim, Hakim are here today to engage each of us on a courageous and crucial conversation, one that I know I'm very excited to listen and learn from. So with that, let's give them both a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, how's everybody doing today? Good, I am very honored to be here with you all today. And again, I wanna thank all of the sponsors for providing this opportunity for me to come and address you all today. And I really just wanna jump right into the talk that I have with you all. Um, the topic of this is called the fifth element of hip hop. The fifth element of hip hop, if we look at hip hop as a culture, there's five elements to hip hop. There's the DJ, the MC, graffiti, it's um, b-boying, which is breakdancing, which people uh, describe as breakdancing. And the fifth element is knowledge, all right, it's knowledge. So what you see and what you've experienced today is that knowledge part of it. And hip hop as a culture has responded to um, racism in America in a, a many different types of ways and have uh, in, been inspired by the civil rights movement, social, study, social justice movements, um, black power era, and those types of things. So I wanna jump into and frame um, this culture for you. Hip hop, through self-expression, um, at its best gives people the power to reimagine and redefine um, and rename their reality. It challenges mainstream sensibilities. It connects communities global, go, globally across racial, social, social, economic, religious, and political lines. It speaks truth to power by giving voice to the voiceless. Hip hop also has an entrepreneurial spirit that provides countless opportunities for people to become business owners. And finally, hip hop gives participants the space to be whoever they claim to be with only two expectations that you show and prove that's who you are. All right, so I wanna give us some examples of what I mean by this. Now. Does anyone know who this woman is here? And why she's so important to hip hop? She had a song back in the 60s called Pillow Talk. Anybody remember that? I know you do, all right? So this is Sylvia Robinson. So as a, as a uh, woman who was in New York during the early 80s, she recognized that talent that she saw and observed young people expressing those five elements or four elements of hip hop culture. And she started a record label called Sugar Hill Records and gave these young folks an opportunity to express themselves. So the first um, mainstream albums come out on Sugar Hill Records back in 1979. You all might remember Rapper's Delight, all right? In 1982, uh, The Message comes out, which was uh, one of the first socially and, and political um, so-called co uh, conscious or woke records that came out. Um, that was Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. We might be familiar with this gentleman here. Who was this person here? Will Smith. But when he first came out, we knew Will Smith by a different name. All right, so imagine this. Will Smith growing up in West Philadelphia, understanding, and for those of you all who walked through the exhibit, that black men are not what they claim to be in those artifacts over there. We're not the N-word, we're not thugs, we're not criminals. But what does he do? He reimagines re his reality. He changes his name and he becomes what? Fresh, he, he becomes royal, he's royalty. I'm a prince. I'm not what you all say I am. And I, I'm fresh with that mic too, right? So this is an example of hip hop, right? So you have him becoming the Fresh Prince, this cassette tape, I think I had this back in high school, all right? And this is our introduction to Will Smith but it also happened with Queen Latifah, right? She's born in New Jersey, Newark, grew, uh, raised in East Orange. But her name was Dana Owens. But she understood that black women are not what society says they are. 
all right? And she says that I'm going to be a queen, right? And if she walked in this room right now, how would we refer to her? As a queen, right? Because she carries herself like that. But she debunked all those stereotypes of black, about black womanhood, all right? And she took on this name, redefined, renamed uh, herself, and people respond to her as such. We know who this guy is right here, Dr. Dre. Not an MD, not a PhD, but as a producer, there's no question about what his beats do, does, you know, in terms of helping to heal people's reality through music, right? He's a part of a group called NWA. For those of us who walked through the exhibit, we saw that N word represented in different parts of that um, exhibit. And what did his group say? We're not that, or if you all claim us to be that, we're gonna show you that with attitude. We're gonna put a mirror up to society and show you how ugly society is. And we're gonna critique it. And look how it, is, it even resonates with us in 2020. One of their favorite songs, or one of their most popular songs was something about the police, right? Uh, y'all laughing because y'all know what it is, right? But that resonated with me in Detroit it resonated with some of us here in Columbus, right? All right, because we understood what our relationship was with some police uh, agencies, and it resonated with us. So we knew exactly what they were talking about. KRS-One did something phenomenal. He recreated this iconic photograph of Malcolm X and put it on the album, um, on his album in 1987. People don't understand that it was hip hop that raised the visibility of Malcolm X at a time where people were not talking about Malcolm X. This is prior to Spike Lee's movie, right? This is prior to the postal stamps coming out. If it wasn't for hip hop, that movie wouldn't have came out, all right? It had, his, his, his legacy had to be resurrected and it was hip hop that did that. Many of us in, this, in, in that generation, we picked up the autobiography of Malcolm X not because we were given that in our K through 12 experience, but we were given that because we were listening to hip hop. And there's groups like Public Enemy. That for me, we learned all types of information about black history through Public Enemy. For example, this lynching that happened in uh, Marion, Indiana in 1930. Public Enemy put that on an album cover back in the early 90s. So this was our introduction to the history of lynching in America came through us being exposed to this album. All right, and I just want to take a couple minutes and think about this picture in particular and think about what's going on in this picture and why people feel so comfortable to participate in something so horrific. All right, one thing about hip hop culture is that we keep it real. We keep it real, right? So it's important that we have conversations where we keep it real. So just asking, what's going on this, in this picture? Why are people feeling so comfortable to participate in a lynching like this in 1930? I'm opening it up to you all. What, what do you think is going on here? Those people at home were seeing that less than human. They were seeing less than human, right? And we know that people are not born, in, born racist. People have to be taught to be racist, right? So in this teaching happened, the socialization happened in many different types of ways. So one way it happened is through books like this. We have this book on display uh, in the back. It's called The Negro, A Beast or in the Image of God, written by Charles Carroll in 1900. Books like this taught that black people were genetically inferior to white people. So if this book is written in 1900 and it's taught in schools, it's taught in churches as well, because this, this book is a theological argument stating that black people are not human beings. This person uses biblical scripture to make that argument, all right? So if you were to ask the people in this picture here, how, they, how would they identify themselves? Oh, we're good Christian folk, right? But obviously that's, a, um, that's not true in terms of what they were being taught and that perversion of the scripture to have them um, respond as, the, as, as such. Now, we're familiar with who those characters are, right? Who are they? 
All right, those are little rascals. We know the little rascals, right? Now, I said that it was through books, but it's also through the media of that era, films. So imagine going into a film house during this time and watching The Little Rascals. And I'm not sure if you all have watched The Little Rascals with adult eyes, but watch what happens here. my right yeah so you get an example in a very innocent type of way through little rascals so children are learning how to separate themselves from the humanity of other people so in that photograph you see young people you see old people but all those people love the little rascals right so um, I just wanted to give you all an example of that every year we celebrate Martin Luther King Day holiday in January. And a couple years ago, a Michigan bar owner had to apologize for gifting one of their employees a watermelon for Martin Luther King Day. Their employee was biracial. On the side of the watermelon, he wrote, happy half Martin Luther King Day. All right. For a society that says that we love, we respect, we revere Dr. King, how do we get as a society where we're celebrating him in this type of way? All right, and this is just one example. But in hip hop, we got a real big issue because for Martin Luther King Day, this is how we've been celebrating King in recent years. Freedom to twerk parties, really? How do we get like that in a society? where well, we're supposed to love and revere and celebrate this man's work. There's a dispensary in America for, doc, for Dr. Martin Luther King Day holiday. They had a sale on marijuana. Is that where we are as a society? How do we get there? I argue that one of the reasons why, we, why we're here in terms of King's legacy is that we're not being taught King's legacy. We're not being taught King's legacy. Most of us see and understand King through a very narrow lens, the I have a dream speech, and that one part of the speech that makes us feel good. I'm about to put you on blast like we say in hip hop. How many books did King write in his lifetime? How many of us has, have read one book that King read or, or wrote in his lifetime? Read one, read one book. Just one person. You, you know what book you read? Okay. All right. But here we are amongst a group of well educated adults who will say that we love and respect King, and most of us don't know how many books he read. Most of us have not read anything by King, but we have this, right? So I'm gonna give you a homework assignment, all right? These are the books that King wrote in his lifetime that none of us have read before. Take a picture of that. Another thing is that most of us don't know, and some of us do, but the younger folks in here might not know the process that it took 
for the king holiday to become a holiday. All right? So it was Congressman John Conyers out of Michigan. Four days after his assassination is when he wrote the initial bill for the king holiday. It took from 1968 all the way up until 1983 for it to become a federal holiday. If it wasn't for Stevie Wonder, Coretta Scott King, Gil Scott Heron, um, Harry Belafonte, Dick Gregory, and a host of many other people had to raise the awareness across the country for people to want to celebrate and, and honor him with a holiday. So we got Stevie Wonder here. But one of the issues is that, guess what, King was a radical in a good way, causing good trouble like John Lewis, right? But can you imagine King being denied going into a black church to speak? But that was happening at the time. A lot of us think that King was accepted by everybody. He was not, right? So it's important that having a collection like this is a way that we remember, in a way that we understand history in its proper context. And understanding, sadly, that if King was alive today, there's certain spaces he would not be allowed to speak, including black churches that, some black churches that celebrate him today wouldn't allow him to speak today. Would he be speaking in the White House in 2020? All right. Well, he had even been speaking at both conventions, not one, but both. Because think about it, he's challenging the status quo. Think about where he would be right now. Think about today, currently, what's happening in Minneapolis. And King said that, I think that we've got to see that riot is the language of the unheard. And what is it that America has failed to hear? It's failed to hear the economic plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. And I would add that America has also failed to hear the call of injustice due to the abuse and um, exploitation of the police um, law enforcement agencies, in many cases, with unarmed black and brown people. That's what we're experiencing right now today. So, I'm going to wrap this up in a few more slides. Who is this individual right here? Harry Belafonte, Harry Belafonte right? A civil rights giant who, in, who now in his 90s has done more work than most of us will ever do in our lifetime. But he's not talked about too much. But it's important that, at least in the hip-hop context, that I bring him up because of the work that he's done in hip-hop. How many of us know that Harry Belafonte gave us our first viewing of hip hop on the big screen via Beach Street back in 1984? He's someone like, uh, he's someone who saw the talent of these young folks in New York City and said, I'm going to put my support behind them and make a movie. Getting back to the MLK Day holiday, we all know John McCain. We respect. John McCain. But John McCain had to apologize later on in his life because he said that he stood on the wrong side of history when it came to the MLK Day holiday in Arizona. But it was hip hop that challenged Arizona via Public Enemy when they wrote the song By the Time I Get to Arizona. Arizona was one of the last um, states to recognize the King holiday. The King holiday was a federal holiday back in 83. It took into the 90s for the state of Arizona to recognize the King holiday, all right? Corporations understand the power of hip hop culture. What message is being sent when products like this come to the market? Wow, Adidas. Someone had the concept of this shoe, bought it to Adidas, and Adidas green-lighted this shoe. Does anybody just offhand tell me what might be problematic with the shoe and it's being promoted to hip hop uh, generation? Shackles. Has shackles on it. Who's, whose idea was that? All right, so the question becomes who's sitting at these tables making these decisions when it comes to products like this? All right? Recently, this is why it's important to have a voice at the table. Nike wanted to put out these Betsy Ross version of Nikes, 
last year around 4th of July. The image on it is a flag from 1775, uh, 1776, right? The original flag. At the same time, slavery was still going on. Colin Kaepernick, Kaepernick brought it to their attention. That's probably not a good idea to put that out. So it, it's important to have voices at the table, right? Anybody know who this guy is? Very important artist, visual artist in American history. Basquiat, some of y'all have been talking about my shoes. Basquiat, Jean-Michel Basquiat, all right? One of his paintings recently sold for $110 million. So we're thinking now about the power of hip hop culture and the influence of it. All right, and this gentleman here, uh, Yusaku uh, Mazawa purchased, imagine having that much disposable income where you can just <laughs> buy a painting for $110 million. And this is the second one he bought. The first one he bought, I think he paid 30 or 40 million for it, all right? But this is the power of hip hop culture. And as an educator, this is how I want to engage my students and, and you know, acknowledge the culture, right? Because a lot of our young folks, they, engage, they, they participate in the culture, but a lot, of them, a lot of them don't know the impact, influence of the culture. So this is a way of addressing that. These are two Detroit hip hop artists here. Um, both of them passed in 2006. The first one, his name is Proof. He was a part of a group called D12. If anybody saw the movie Eight Mile, Makai Pfeiffer played him in the movie Eight Mile. Uh, the second person is Jay Dilla, who is um, a phenomenal producer uh, out of Detroit in the 90s, in uh, the, early two, uh, two th or the early 2000s. And uh, he was responsible for working with a tribe called Quest, Busta Rhymes, Erica Badu, The Roots, and many, many other people. But they both um, unfortunately passed away in 2006. When you look at these two posters, what image does this remind you of? And again, we talk about the influence and impact of hip hop culture. All right, obviously it looks like Obama, right? So the guy who was commissioned to do the Obama poster was a hip hop fan. Not only a fan of hip hop, but he's also a fan of the Black Panther Party as well. And you see it throughout his work. But that person is Shepard Ferry of uh, Obey Clothing, inspired by the Black Panther Party and hip hop in 2008 those two posters become the template for the Hope poster, right? And Change poster, all right? And that's you know, just an example of, of hip hop. Um, Andy, how, how much more time do I have? Good deal. All right, so I wanna wrap this up in two, two slides. What's the historical significance and connection between these three men? Again, we have um, Harry Belafonte in that first picture. The person who's sitting next to him is Sidney Poitier. All right, and then in the middle, obviously, we have Jackie Robinson, and then Barack Obama. What's the significance of? They're all first. All right, all first in the field. All right, but it goes a little bit deeper than that. Imagine being activists in the 1950s and 60s and putting your money towards social justice um, initiatives, right? And not knowing the impact that your life would have on the world. I have a letter here, and you can't read it, but I'll, I'll explain it to you. I purchased this letter maybe 20 years ago. At the bottom, it's signed by Harry Belafonte, Jackie Robinson, and Sidney Poitier. I got this letter just because of those autographs, and I put it on display and traveled around with it, and people just love the letter. About 10 years ago, something told me, it'd probably be a good idea if you actually read the content of it. All right, so reading the content, watch what happens. This letter is from an organization that they were a part of called the African American Student Foundation. All right, 1959. They put their resources behind this project to bring African students from Africa to America for college. Mm -hmm. Now, the first 81 students came from the country of Kenya. 
going back to that question, what's the connection between those men? How about this? Barack Obama's father was one of those 81 students. Imagine being so dedicated to this work and trusting and being faithful that the work that, you do, that you're doing is going to make an impact. But you don't know what type of impact that's going to make. But wow, they made this investment in students, and it produced the first black president in the form of Barack Obama. Right? So I think, um, I think I'm going to end with that and open up the floor to some questions. So much. Um, thank you. <laughs> through your work, I'm wondering what have you, have you learned, and through your collections and your collecting, what you've learned about our proclivity, our propensity, our, our uh, defaulting nature to want to collect autographs mm -hmm. and not know the substance. Wow. That's interesting. I, I think it's, I think we're it's, all guilty of it. it we're, we're all guilty of it, and, and it's funny because I've always been a collector. And one of the first images that I remember of me getting an autograph was my father taking me to the auto show in Detroit um, in Batman and the original Batman and Robin. Adam the, West. Adam and West and <laughs> I forgot Robin's name. Uh, Bert, Bert Ward. Okay. Was, was Robin. So there's a picture of me and my brother standing here and Burt Ward is signing his autograph for me. So I, I think my, my experience started there. But from that point, I was collecting. You know, I, I used to go to baseball games and collect autographs. So I, I think it, it, it just brings you to a certain point in time. And it's about memory. And, um, and you know, it's, it's about recognizing history and, and, and value. And, yeah. and then, then that, that willingness to stop short of going beyond the autographs. So right, right, right. you obviously, you know, you've dedicated your life to the study right. of these things, right. but even you didn't read the letter. At, at, that, at that point, right. yes, yeah. But, um, you know, it, it's, you know, your focus becomes something different, right? And at the time, again, I, I was, I didn't start off being a, a collector and educator. I started off collecting just for myself. So for me, autograph, that was enough for me. But then you realize that when you eventually have an archive, that there's a larger weight there. So you have to become a researcher. So, well, you, and it looks like pieces to a puzzle, too. It is, yeah. It, you see, start to see all the connections. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it made me think about our our tendency in, in our society, and I don't know really any other societies that well, so I can't speak, but to want to venerate and settle for that. So, and, and, and t saying that Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't welcome at every black church because he was considered a radical, right. uh, he wasn't a perfect person, we, we tend to want to venerate no matter what and settle for that. Right, but that, that's important, that's the important thing about getting people to a baseline of, of understanding and then charging people with the task of digging deeper. If I can bring you so far, then now that you have you know, this new information, now it's on you to take it to the next level. So um, Black History 101 is very intentional in terms of name. This is just an introduction. All right, and it's, and it's still just an introduction to me. And, and so, so we, 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 we get that introduction and then we dig deeper. So knowledge isn't just power, it's responsibility. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. When did you turn the corner with this? When did you start to connect the dots and think about this as a tool instead of a collection? 1995, um, I went to the Million Man March in 1995. Um, there was a call for a million men to go to uh, Washington, D.C. under the themes of responsibility, atonement, and reconciliation. And when I walked away from that experience, I took what was a private collection at home, and I started to do public exhibits, small at first, um, with some local uh, grassroots organizations in Detroit, and it grew from there. 
how much has it influenced your life as an educator? So you taught uh, junior high. Middle school, yeah. Um, I, props, <laughs> junior, <laughs> fun. The, toughest, the toughest grades. Yeah. But when you were teaching, what did you see? What was missing then? And do you see much difference now? What was missing then um, in the classroom yeah. are, are, are resources, textbooks that tell the story of black history, not only black history, but the history of just marginalized people, period. So we have to, um, we find ourselves, teachers um, who are in here, we find ourselves supplementing all the time what's missing in the textbook. So this is my attempt. This is the work of filling those gaps that were missing. It seems like as we fill in the gaps, we start to get a whole picture of the country not as, as exceptional as Americans like to think it is. Right. Yeah, I, I, again, it's, it's um, part of it is making a commitment to speak truth to power. A part of it in terms of, you know, hip hop is keeping it real. And we have to be honest, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's the big thing is being honest about what the history is. It, I shouldn't have to wait till you know my favorite hip hop artist puts out a song or an album that speaks to something I should have been taught back in junior high school to get certain lessons, right? So I, I shouldn't be an adult finding out about Ella Baker or finding about um, you know just other just great you know historical figures. But even with hip hop, it was regardless of the powerhouses that were behind it it was still stigmatized, and then therefore uh, it was okay to ignore it as, a, right. as an intellectual to as an intellectual device. Right, so but one of the best things about hip hop culture is that it's gonna prick you until you pay attention. Again, it's, it's, this is the, the, the um, music of the voiceless. So if you're not hearing me, you're gonna hear me one way or the other. Persistence. Yeah, absolutely. And then, um, it, when it comes to the Minneapolis, I, I remember I was on, on vacation when uh, over the over Memorial when um, George Floyd was murdered, and then the uh, demonstrations broke out, and everyone kind of said, "Well, it's only going to last a couple days." Right. Uh, we're very. It seems like we like to kind of compartmentalize as well, and okay, that's over with now. Let's move on, and mm -hmm. it's not over. It's with. not. People are not going to rest until they get justice. People are not going to rust. I mean, it, it's at a tipping point right now in America. Why? Why now? Because it's the same thing that, that King, the quote I use for, with King. People are not listening. And, and so Colin Kaepernick took a knee. That's the most passive thing that you can do, right? Took a knee. And look at the hell he caught. And he's still not back in the NFL. So if you're not listening, then it's going to escalate. But he's at the table at Nike. Well, he's at the table at Nike, but he wants to, he wants to play football. That's, that's been the whole thing. Yeah, so, yes. that, so, so Nike is a detour, you know, and he probably would have had an endorsement, you know, anyway, but this man wants, I mean, that's what he wants to do. So, and again, if he's, if he's just taking a knee, Martin Luther King was just engaged in Nonviolent direct action. They killed him. So what do you expect? I mean, it's at, I, again, it's at, it's at a tipping point now. And it's not just, these are not just black folks who are out here doing this. This is multiracial. This is a lot of different people who are on the scene right now. I, um, I was in Kalamazoo just a couple of weeks, weeks ago when the Proud Boys came through Kalamazoo. They got met with a group that I'd never even heard of before called the uh, People's Defense League. These are white men and women who are protecting people from the likes of groups like the Proud Boys. I was shocked because I assumed when I walked in and saw that, I was like, these Proud Boys got guns and everything. Wasn't the Proud Boys. So, and you know, I, I felt looking at that, it's like, wow, I'm about to see the Civil War happen again. I mean, that's the, that's the reality I felt because it got violent there. I wasn't expecting that, but that's where it is. That's where it is now. Yeah, because if it's, if it's happening in Kenosha and then in Kalamazoo and these small towns, you know, it's, you know, Portland, Oregon, I spent a lot of time in Portland. And um, it's, 
Yeah. I think the Is small it? town stories are really interesting yeah. and a big, big, uh, represent a big, huge change um, mm -hmm. from previous. It is uh, CMC's tradition to take audience questions. Jane Scott, CMC's president, is curating questions from the live stream audience. And if you're here in our audience, please remember to keep your microphone time uh, to the question. And we thank you for avoiding editorial comments. And Jane, what is our first question? Sure, I have a, I have a couple questions. Um, one that came in online, and I apologize, I do not have the person that asked this, but was there a specific instance in the Million Man March that inspired you to start the Black History 101 Mobile Museum? You know, it, it, again, it was the it was the theme of the uh, of the of the march. It was that that commitment that we made to be responsible, to um, focus on reconciliation um, and and atonement as well. So, you know, as a black man, taking responsibility of our communities. You know, so that that was that was a big thing. That was a big walk uh, takeaway. And at the time, you know, at the time I didn't know exactly what my contribution was going to be, but I had to go back and think of, like, what can I, what what do I have? And then it hit me, like, I got this collection. I just can start sharing it. And then come to find out that, in the history of the Black Museum movement in America, this is how Black Museums started. Why? Because white museums were not given space to our story, right? So, but that, that's where it, where it started. And, and a little bit of a follow-up question. What's the aha of any particular item that you've collected that you didn't know about and that you learned your own history lesson from? Ooh, I have a great story. I'm, I'm writing a book right now called Divine Affirmations. And these divine affirmations are my experience with these artifacts that I couldn't um, imagine in a million years ever coming into my possession, right? So I have in Detroit and possibly in places like Columbus, at least in Detroit, there's a lot of abandoned buildings and homes. So there's an underground economy where people go into old homes and get antique things out of them. It could be fixtures or lights or just whatever. Uh, but besides that, People have left photographs, letters, things like that in these households. Um, I got a phone call from a gentleman who was familiar with my work, and he said they found three documents in this one household. Um, they're from the, about the 40s. One document was signed by Mary McLeod Bethune when she came to D Detroit to have a lecture for the 16th av uh, anniversary of the Delta's um, sorority, um, their convention. The second one was signed by Paul Robinson when he came to Detroit and sang. The third one was when um, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who was a father of black history, came to Detroit and did a lecture on black history at one of the churches in Detroit. Again, they were all autographed. I wasn't thinking. I put them on display and just had them up. One day, the spirit hit me and said, why don't you open those up and read them? It was probably a few months later. On the inside of the program of the Carter G. Woodson piece, there's a list of patrons that brought him to town in 1938. As I'm going down this list, my grandparents are listed. Oh. Wow. That, those art items sat in that house for all of those years for me to go to elementary school, middle school, high school, never knowing I was ever going to be a collector or ever go and be a teacher. And who in the world starts a mobile museum and just decides that I'm going to travel the country? So when people are questioning, like, you crazy for doing that, it's like I'm getting these affirmations that I was born to do this work. And that's just one example. But there's many, many examples that I've, I've had over the years like that. Well, this question, this question comes from Dr. Roger Blackwell, who incidentally we need to thank uh, Roger because he purchased a virtual table today. So he's, he's here in spirit with a virtual table. Thank you. Um, he's asking the question, are there examples of successful black entrepreneurs in the historical artifacts in your museum? Absolutely. The first person I shared today was Sylvia Robinson, who's an entrepreneur. Um, but besides her, I mean, we... I, I mean, there, there's, there's literally dozens of, of um, entrepreneurs, especially coming from hip hop. Uh, Jay-Z, um, Kanye, um, uh, Chance the Rapper, um, Queen Latifah, I mean, Ice Cube. 
there, there's many, many uh, entrepreneurs. So it seems to me like, given the, the nature of the politics and race politics in this country, entrepreneur is a very common theme in in African American history. It well, had I mean, to be. yeah, we, we we were we were forced to take care of ourselves. But in in hip hop in particular, though, it, it's it's amazing because it's it's, it's a it's a it's an industry that people don't, or it's a field that people don't talk about and give us credit for. Like, again, hip hop gives us the space to be whoever we wanna be as long as we show and prove that's who we are. I ended up becoming a manager in hip hop and a booking agent simply because I said I can make connections between people. And as long as I can show and prove to the artist and the promoter that's who I am, I'm a booking agent. All right, well, show and prove that's who you are. I started making connections. Hip hop literally took me around the world. The person I mentioned, Proof of D12, I was his manager. Hip hop took me around the world. And when people ask, you know, how did you, why is the collection so diverse in terms of material? It's because I've dug through antique shops all around the country in different, you know, different parts of Europe and Australia, but that's a part of it. But hip hop gave me that space to do that and gave me the opportunity. To, I didn't have to, go to college at least for that part of it. But um, yeah, it, it, it gave me that opportunity. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Renee Delane from Women Who Dare. Uh, Dr. El Hakim, is that correct? Yes. Pronounced? Can you share with us, since you touched on it already, how profoundly impacted you were by seeing your grandparents were a sponsor? Yes. Uh, tell us more about your parents and then going back to your grandparents so we know a little bit more about your roots. Absolutely. So, <clears throat> so I was born and raised in Detroit. Uh, my mother is a first generation immigrant from Canada. Um, and the reason why um, her parents were from Canada is because when you go back in our history, uh, several generations, um, my great, 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 great grandparents escaped via the Underground Railroad um, from Virginia plantations and went up through uh, Detroit and across the Detroit River and settled in a place called Dresden, Ontario, which was the um, area where uh, Josiah Henson, uh, who was the, the um, inspiration for Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, where he settled, right? So, um, so on my mother's side, we have Cana uh, Canadian roots. Um, on my father's side, he was born and raised in East St. Louis. Um, he, he, um, he and my mom divorced when I was five. My, my father ended up um, converting to Judaism and got married, married a Jewish woman. And so a part of my childhood was growing up between a very conservative Christian household and then a very Jewish household. And then I go to college and you know, gain the knowledge itself and become a Muslim. So, <laughs> so you know, it, it, is very, it, it was a very interesting experience in that, that regard. But I mean, it's very rich though, you know what I'm saying? Like a, I had a very rich um, childhood and, and um, rich experience with my parents and understanding um, my, my uh, background with my grandparents and um, knowing that history of them, um, of the Underground Railroad um, through, through their experience. Thank you. So Trip, asked, Trip Lazarus, who happens to be the son of one of our founders for the Metropolitan Club, asked who is standing in the way of including the history of the marginalized into our current curriculum? One, can you say that one more time? Yeah. Who's standing in the way of including um, the history of marginalized Who, people in right. our current? Who's standing current? in the way? Mm -hmm. what, what's oh. preventing it? What's the obstacle? Oh, wow. Um, a commitment from government agencies that, that uh, government agencies that control, con uh, who create policy and curriculum. Um, it's teacher prep programs across the nation that have an opportunity to educate pre-service teachers in understanding uh, that history and preparing them to go and teach diverse groups of students. Um, and it's school boards who buy textbooks and don't make demands of uh, textbooks publishers to make sure that these histories are included. I mean, there's many different ways that we can hold people accountable, but where's the desire to hold those, those different agencies and entities um, accountable. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Elizabeth Joy Elevated Outcomes, and this question somewhat connects to the previous question. You spoke to the importance of knowing and knowledge, and you also spoke to keeping it real. Yes. 
Um, wondering your thoughts on the difficulty for specifically white America to acknowledge the truth of the past and the present and how that creates a difficult, um, a barrier to being able to move forward because of that discomfort when that history doesn't necessarily look well upon a group of people. Right. I mean, that, that's the huge question and that's a huge challenge right there. But we have to keep on being persistent and, and having dialogue like this. Like, how many places around the country is this dialogue taking place right now? You know, so we have to be willing to find like-minded people, create the spaces, um, encourage our white allies to go back and talk to people who look like them, right? So, and, and we, we just have to engage in, 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 this, in this struggle, you know? We have, we have to read Martin Luther King because some of the same people that, that claim that, you know, um, well, I'm, I'm down with King have not read King. Right, so we, we, challenge, we challenge people where they're at. Thank you. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed today's forum. It's, this one's moved up on my list of favorite CMC forums we've held. Um, it's um, it's kind of eye-opening when you start looking into it, so thank you. Um, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum will be open all day tomorrow. There are many one-hour slots available. Please go to our website and reserve your time to attend. Kids under 12 are free and $10 for adults. Um, next week, we will explore mental and physical health with back-to-school time in mind as we get a prescription and a toolkit for coping this fall. I I'd like to thank our sponsors today, the presenting sponsor, Cardinal Health, and Puffin Foundation West, United Way of Central Ohio, Event Marketing Strategies, WCBE, the Hilton Downtown Columbus, the Vote House, and our partners, the Central Ohio African American Chamber of Commerce, and our live stream partners, PNC, WOSU Public Media, and the Columbus Dispatch, and to our online virtual seat patrons, thank you. Um, and finally, a special thanks to our speakers, Dr. Khalid Al-Hakim and Ann Fisher. We hope to see you again soon, but until then, be well and stay safe.